Hi, everybody. This is Dee Dee Russell with WeddingVenueOwners.com. I am here today with Greg Ingstrom with White Oak Farm in Michigan City, Indiana. And Greg is going to share some insight with us on permits and kind of some of the processes that venue owners go through when they're starting up a venue, keeping in mind that every city is different, every town is different, every county and state has different regulations. And so you kind of have to figure those things out a little bit on your own, unfortunately, because every location is so different. But this is going to give us some good ideas, um, some good insight on what to expect as we're getting started. So, Greg, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing this information. My pleasure. Could you tell us a little bit about your wedding venue? So, uh, our uh, we bought a 80-acre farm. Um, it had a couple of barns on it that uh, we were going to rehab. And first we tore down the small barn because it wasn't usable. And slowly but surely we tore down the big barn too. And so we built two brand new uh, barns and added a lot of character. We put in a pond and uh, lots of landscaping and so forth. Our first wedding was May 1st of this year. Um, couldn't tell you how many we've had, but we've been... Uh, very fortunate and booked solid uh, this past weekend we had five and we have five this weekend too so wow so you might be absolutely exhausted i'm gonna guess yeah so uh, you know you learn a lot of things pretty quickly and uh, i i read your uh, facebook stuff and, and follow a lot of what's going on and uh, yeah we're gonna ban um, things that are not live plants to be thrown around um we picked up a few thousand uh, silk petals this last uh, Saturday night. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was yeah. not fun, I bet, at all. Especially when you have back to back, right. you can't just leave it there. I don't think people no. understand that. Yeah, and the worst part is just a tiny puff of wind and it it would just spread all out again. So it, was, uh, it wasn't any fun. But uh, yeah, you know, we learn a lot thanks to you. Well, I appreciate that. I'm glad to know that um, you're getting some good info from the wedding venue owners and managers community on Facebook. Um, so one of the questions that comes up so often, and we don't really have a great solid information on it, is what, um, you know, what is the process of getting a permit? What are some of the things that a, biz a venue owner will go through and experience as they're just trying to get open? Um, you started May 21st, but how long did it actually take you in that process to get open and up and running? Well, the whole thing was about a five-year project. Um, but let me uh, talk about zoning because that's the big question that came up here recently. And uh, in my current career, my real career, if you want to call it that, I, I deal in a lot of real estate and uh, have been uh, on both ends of the zoning board um, one of them is strapped in front of a freight train and the other one is a big parade for, you know, doing whatever it is we were doing. So, um, if you're thinking of starting a venue, it is very important to make sure you comply with zoning. And so the zoning for a wedding venue is, is sometimes very specific. So, um, it may fall under banquet halls. It may fall under a restaurant use. Um, and I don't advise not using an attorney um, because there are some nuances. And, and, and the, the most important thing is um, most of the zoning boards are just volunteers. I mean, yes, they get paid a little bit, but they are not professionals. Um, they live in the neighborhood. Uh, a lot of times they're school teachers or former administrators of some kind, policemen, firemen. Occasionally, there's a business person on the board. But that's, uh, that's, you're lucky if you have one. And um, the problem is that a lot of things can go wrong or right during the hearing. So... Um, I'll give you a couple war stories and then I'll kind of give you some advice. Well, we learn from those. So those are very valuable. I'll give you a couple war stories um, and I'll make them relatively brief. We were uh, working with a partner in Chicago to rehab a pretty rough building. Um, it was about three quarters of a city block uh, long and half a city block deep. 
and uh, it boarded up, all the copper stolen out of it and so forth, uh, but in a very prime neighborhood. The business we were going to put in was a pawn shop, which is somewhat controversial, but uh, it was a double play in the sense that uh, at this time in 2011 and 12, the economy was not good and the pawn shop would have uh, theoretically done pretty well. And as the economy got better, pawn shop would be less busy and the, the development side of the real estate, the rest of the building uh, would, have, would have probably picked up the slack. Anyway, uh, we met with uh, the aldermen who are considered mayors in their little fiefdom. Um, and uh, they were in favor of it. So um, it was gonna be a great thing and something turned. The tide turned and they started uh, uh, working against us and so forth and becoming more and more difficult. So we went through the trouble of standing out in the street in front of the building because there was a bus stop there and asking people if they would be in favor of this. Uh, besides that, uh, we had uh, 400 signatures in favor of it, which is very, very difficult to do. That cost a lot of time. And uh, we went to our uh, zoning meeting and got murdered, absolutely murdered. Um, so anyway. When you say day, murdered, were they just brutalizing you up there with questions and just pound, pound, pound and going to town on you with, this is terrible, we don't want this kind of a thing? Yeah, yeah, basically. Who and, was there you know, with you? Who was part of your team? Was it just you and an investor, you and your lawyer? Like who was there on your behalf? So uh, a partner and I and our attorney, and I think they had a, a, a second attorney, and we also had people to testify in favor of, including a, uh, was he a lieutenant detective that worked the pawn detail in Chicago Police Department? Um, but something turned from the time we started to the time we went to the hearing, and uh, the deal was killed. So... Um, I, uh, on another property in Indiana, where I'm from, uh, we were going to uh, rehab a large building and put a pawn shop in. This dates back to about 1995, maybe, maybe earlier. Anyway, um, they loved it, loved the idea. Uh, they liked the pawn shop and, and everything was good. So, um, same, same city, 10 years later, we wanted to get a variance so we could put U-Haul trucks out front. No. So uh, learned a lot of things and let me kind of bring you up to where we ended up on our venue. So it's a farm, working farm, uh, has a lot of woods. Uh, it was about 50% farmland and 50% uh, wooded and, and the homestead. So, um, what we did for several purposes is we divided the property prior to buying it. In other words, we went to the current owners at the time and said, we'll buy this property, but you must divide it. What we did is we divided out the portion that we were really going to use for the venue currently. We're not going to build a, a 85 acre uh, venue, right? So, um, we divided the property into several parcels and that's the way we bought it. We also titled some of the parcels differently. And let me explain why this is. When you go um, to get something rezoned, you have to notify all your neighbors. Right. And each um, uh, district or city or town or county has a different way of looking at neighbors. Certainly, across the street is considered an adjoining neighbor. But by separating this property out, three quarters of the neighbors were us. So we really only had to notify a quarter of what would consider, be considered um, the neighbors if we rezoned the entire parcel, which is hard to do. It's hard to rezone a large parcel like that for a spatial use. So um, then we went to, we tried to go to most of the neighbors, not all of them. Uh, I have found that if the house is trash and there's junk in the yards and that sort of thing, they're going to be the most uncooperative. 
and the people with the nicer homes that keep everything neat are generally more cooperative, have no idea why. But so we went to neighbors and we did have a form the attorney gave us. Um, and it, it's not that people would sign in favor of the project, but they signed that they didn't object to it. Hmm. So we got six of those, which six signatures, uh, six. Yeah. Uh, and, and doesn't I, seem I, like tell me again, how many in total did you have to go to? Uh, we had about 16 neighbors that we okay. had to contact. So, I mean, a lot of people just weren't home and, and we couldn't do this, you know, every day. So, sure. um, and so one, a pretty good number out of that though. Yeah. If you can get even a hand, like I say, a handful of signatures, that's, that's a big thing. And especially, uh, the location of the people that, um, are in favor of it, the closer they are, the more or the more impacted they may be, the more weight that holds. Um, Can I ask you, this is something that comes up so often in the group and that people are really just stumped on. You went door to door. A lot of people just, or, or I'm assuming that you did, a lot of people just mailed them out. But do you feel like your, was that something you were required to do in your county? Um, was that something you were, um, you know, suggested by your attorneys? Was that the way you just decided to handle it? What were your thoughts on that? So you do have to mail them a certified letter. So they got that. And um, we went around, I can't remember now if we went around before the certified letter or after. I think it's better to do it before because people will, anytime you get something certified in the mail, it makes your heart skip a beat because um, uh, you just never know what it is. So uh, we went out prior to, we went out several days and, and tried to hit people up as we could find them. The weekends were the best, but uh, we had people that wouldn't sign, of course. Um, and then we, we found somebody that vehemently opposed us. And um, the issue with that is they were the directly across the street from our driveway or the driveway we were installing. So they held a little bit more weight. Of course, their neighbor next to them had a house that is totally inhabitable and they were even madder about it. But, you know, uh, they afraid their values would drop. But anyway, the place. Is that um, what you feel this fear is coming from that, that having a wedding venue or an event space or a wedding barn is going to decrease property value? Where does that fear come from? Is it legitimate? Is that all over the internet? Is that, is that a real estate rule I'm not aware of? So there's, uh, there's a few ways that people can oppose, uh, successfully oppose and stop a zoning change. And that would be dropping in uh, the pro their property, uh, dropping in value as a direct result. Safety, uh, people walking the streets or there's too many cars, too much traffic and drainage. So whatever you're doing, are you causing water to go to their property? Those are the three things that they can stop your project with. They don't like it. They don't like you. Um, they like a quiet neighborhood without it. That doesn't hold much weight. So they generally jump on um, one of those three things or all three of them, especially if they talk to an attorney ahead of time. So um, that, that's, um, and, and of course, we were going from agricultural to a specific use as a wedding venue, or in our case, it, um, uh, Sorry, my mind just went blank. But anyway, there's a specific category for what we do. Um, banquet hall. Um, so we can't do anything else uh, that's not related. But as long as we rent it out as a banquet hall, we're okay. So we can't change our mind and use the place to sew quilts or anything else. You wouldn't be um, able to add B&B &B or overnight lodging or something down correct. the road. Not Okay. Right. That's not included. And um, they, so um, along with those three issues, you have to be prepared to prove um, to the board that that is not the case. The property is not going to go down in value. The uh, traffic is not going to uh, increase accidents or safety concerns and that you're not going to drain water or sewage or anything else onto their property. 
And you kind of have to have those ducks in a row first. It, it's a very difficult situation. What is the horse and what is the cart? But you have to be able to fight those three things first um, because those, those can kill you uh, on the spot if you don't have an answer for them. So you may have to spend some money on engineering, um, maybe a little bit of traffic study. Although in reality, we didn't do a traffic study. The thing is that um, it's not like a church service where everybody has to be there at nine o'clock and everybody's leaving at 10 o'clock. People wander in. I mean, some people come late, uh, some people come very early. So it's not a huge amount of traffic at any one time. And, and that's the, the best defense uh, with the traffic concern is that, that people don't arrive and don't leave all at the same time. It, it's almost like a restaurant. They, they kind of come and go over a period of, you know, eight or 10 or 12 or 15 hours. Um, so the other thing I, I have to, uh, I have to say over and over is you have to have a competent attorney. And not just an attorney that you know, because he's your neighbor or friend, or he handles somebody's divorce, or, you know, you need a zoning attorney. And a big part of that is not what they know, is that they know this board. Um, again, these people are quasi-volunteers, and um, they get their feelings hurt. They have egos, um, they have biases, and you, you have to have somebody that can kind of negotiate or find their way through that. And again, you're going to have to speak. It's not, in my opinion, you can't just have your attorney. Uh, I've seen that many times where the owner doesn't show up and just has the attorney do it. And um, it's, uh, it's dicey. But the other side of that coin is the attorney knows how to answer the questions. And if you're standing up there, you may answer something incorrectly. And, and let me give you some examples. When, when we went before the zoning board for our wedding venue, uh, I went to the previous month's meeting and watched the process, watched the people. Um, oh. And I saw a, a guy get what I call pigeonholed. Um, he was going to do an auction facility. And they said, well, what time do you usually do auctions? He says, well, usually Saturdays at noon or one o'clock, but you don't do them at seven or eight in the morning, right? No, 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 no. And they don't last till midnight, right? No, no, no. So we can safely say uh, that your uh, auctions run from noon to five. Yeah, that's probably all right. All right so we're going to limit you. You can't start an auction before noon and it must be done by five. He pleaded for a little more time. I think they gave him an extra hour or two. That's dangerous stuff. Um, you know, they may ask, how many people uh, do you think you'll have? And you say, well, the capacity of the building is 120 or it's 250. They may say, all right, that's your limit, 250 people, no more. Well, what if you uh, have an outdoor event, you know, and now you have more than that. So um, you got to be very careful about the questions they ask you. And then again, um, if they ask you about weddings, be sure that they don't say, well, that's all you're going to do, right, is weddings. Mm. Because what if you want to do um, memorial service or you want to do corporate events or birthday parties? So um, and that your, your attorney can advise you best. But um, again, I think it's better if you are there, your wife is there or husband or whatever, children are there. Uh, we took as many kids as we can round up. We have six all together. We couldn't get them all there, but we had girlfriends and boyfriends. So we took up a row and a half and just showing here's our family. We're working on this project together. That means a lot. If you're a big corporation out of New York City and you're just going to jam this in and because you're a big shot, they're going to murder you. You can't, yeah. you can't go in there with uh, that sort of attitude. Um, again, they, these people are not professionals. They may have done it for a while, but they don't have a degree in zoning. Did the, um, did the neighbors that did not want you to be there, did they show up at the hearing? They did. 
Did yeah. they, did they, and so is it standard that everyone gets a chance to speak and they get their time? How long, you know, does this process usually take that you're in court? So uh, they do it in the evenings here. Um, they don't want it to last more than an hour or two. Now, if they have several um, uh, hearings, uh, it may last longer, but they don't want one hearing to go an hour and a half. I mean, 30 minutes, 45, you know, they have lives too. Yeah. So one of the things, they will cut somebody off um, if they're just being ridiculous. Again, they have to point out uh, things that are, are illegal issues, flooding, traffic and safety, property values. They don't like the color of your building, doesn't count. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that, that are just personal that, that really are not a, uh, they'll hear them sometimes, but they're not part of the legal process. Um, our neighbor, uh, yeah, a couple of them spoke. It, it, they kind of shot themselves in the foot with, um, and I can't remember exactly what they said, but we're able to essentially have a conversation with them. You have to give them their time to talk. And they may ask you a question, you know, in my case, they ask, ask me a question or two. And, and I can kind of cross examination them, not, um, not mean like on TV, but just, uh, well, how often do you walk your granddaughter down that road where, yeah. you know, and, and the guy says, well, I, you know, as often as I can, I said, how fast do cars go down that road now? Oh, they go 50 miles an hour. Well, they're not going to be going 50 miles an hour by your house when they're turning right across the street, right directly across the street from your driveway. They're not going to be going 50 because they're either turning right or left into our place. So there's some opportunities. You really have to be able to, to think on your feet. And it's, there's nothing wrong with consulting your attorney before you ask a question. Um, you want to be very careful of blurting something out, especially if somebody gets under your skin and uh, they'll try very hard to do that. People, um, there's a saying around here and I posted it on the group. Um, the local mayor here is a friend of mine. He's retired now. but uh, he called these cave people, and that is citizens against virtually everything. <laughs> so there are people, and and uh, I'm involved in another project, another property we own that were unrelated, but um, actually went and met with a couple of neighbors, and two of them, and they're elderly people, women, not that that matters, but they were bragging about how they fought these other things in their past and won and made sure that that guy didn't put up that building or put in those railroad tracks or, you know, they were proud of stopping progress. And for some people, that's, um, you know, they, I don't want to necessarily call it jealousy, but people can't do what you want to do or what you're going to do. And they don't want you to be able to do it either. There's a lot of very negative people. I think that's very valid. That combined with fear, fear of change, fear of progress. Um, what I wish people would understand is that people like you that come in and create these you know, events are putting heads in beds and creating revenue for so many other people around you. Um, you know, for the gas stations as guests come into town, for the tourism as guests can come into town and fall in love with the town, for the bed and breakfast, for the hotels, for the restaurants, for the catering. You know, one wedding venue can do, you know, 35 to 50 weddings a year. That's an average number. A lot of them do a hundred, but if you just do 50 a year at 10 vendors per wedding, that's a hundred, I'm sorry, that's about 500 different jobs or positions that are being created by one venue. And that's pretty amazing. Not to mention the venues that come along and save these gorgeous historic farms or orchards. There, I, I work with one venue, I love them. Um, Cornelia, she's in West Virginia and her family, the family that she's, her family has owned this orchard for, for decades, I think for generations. And they wouldn't be able to have that if it wasn't for the revenue from the weddings that come in because orchards are expensive and those types of things don't profit. So to keep that historic orchard and that historic barn up to date takes a lot of money. Just like the historic buildings in our towns that some of these um, investors come in and save and salvage and bring back to life. The beautiful you know, um, 
uh, theaters that are coming back to life with all their vintage architecture that are being used for wedding venues. So there's a lot of, um, you know, amazing people like yourself that are coming in and bringing value to the community, but also, uh, you know, saving these farms or um, developing, you know, so I love that. And I wish it looked, you know, people would, uh, you know, admire that a little bit more and it wouldn't trigger those fear sensors or those jealousies because um, it is a lot of hard work as well. So um, you, you, you had the hearing, what are your thoughts on, is it smart or is it, is it asking for trouble to have some of the wedding venue vendors that you might potentially work with, some of the more reputable license insured, like a DJ that's been around for 20 years or a wedding planner that's been around for five or 10 years that's really reputable and really professional. Does it make sense to invite someone like that to come to those hearings with you as you know, a way to show that this is a professional industry with license, insurance, safety protocols, safety measures, professional business owners that require contracts? Um, that's a very good question. And in some cases, um, no, in all cases, people that will speak of your integrity and your acumen and, and what you want to do and the uh, people that know you well is, is very good. Just remember one thing is that they may not want to hear too much from people who do not live nearby. Okay. It's, um, you know, people that are kind of unrelated because remember, you're doing something in someone's neighborhood. Yeah. And it is nearly impossible to get someone to speak on your behalf that is your neighbor. Oh, if you can yeah. get one or two, I mean, we had six signatures, but none of them showed up. Uh, we ask them and yeah, okay. I'll be, you know, they just, they just don't. Uh, the only people that show up in general are people talking against you. So yeah, anybody, um, you know, I wouldn't bring, you know, 25 people, um, especially if they don't live nearby. Um, but if you can, and, and this is where, uh, this whole thing is a political process and, uh, politics are a very uh, interesting thing to, and, and I've been involved uh, and still am uh, from local levels all the way to national. And so zoning boards are, at least in Indiana, by law, they're independent of any political process. They actually cannot even meet with the mayors and so forth, uh, elected officials. So, but that doesn't mean that. Um, somebody can't put a good word in for you, that makes a big difference. Or a bad word, if, uh, if your neighbor knows one of the county commissioners and bends their ear and they're sympathetic to them, you could, you could have a problem and not even know why. It just came from the back door. So one of the things that, and I, I'm involved in other businesses, real estate and so forth, and I really push people to, you need to know your politicians. And, you know, as the elections come around, go to the chili suppers and so forth, meet and greet, don't ask for anything, right? You just want to be their friend. And there's more to that. And I'll explain that in a second. But the point is, is as you get to know them, and at some point, you're going to go to a fundraiser and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about developing this thing and putting a wedding venue in, you know, whatever, it can gain you some points and some conversations that you'll never know even happen. And um, I could give you a thousand examples of that, but that's not what this is about. But uh, what is important is that you have some friends inside the government, elected officials or otherwise, um, that you've maybe asked about your idea. You know, there's other things involved besides zoning, which are fit together tax abatements, uh, historic preservation grants, or um, things like that. And um, as you talk to more and more people, if they kind of like your idea, um, the, the zoning is, um, how do I want to describe this? This is a serious piece of work that requires lots of homework, lots of planning, thinking these things through. I've seen many projects die because they couldn't answer questions. Um, they uh, didn't engage the neighbors. And sometimes that 
you know, your attorney would know better whether to engage neighbors or not. Sometimes it is, they're going to fight you no matter what. So why give them more ammo? But um, you really got to think that through, think through your project and you can ask them questions. You know, um, again, it's not a hearing like, um, it's kind of open you know, there can be a dialogue. It's not necessarily question and answer. Although, like I say, they will cut people off at two minutes or whatever they determine if there's a whole bunch of people waiting to talk. Um, and they run that meeting. They own that meeting. They almost always have an attorney, uh, but that's a staff attorney that's not a voting member. So um, I, I would keep that uh, as as something that you should, as you formulate a plan or you look at a piece of property, or if you have one, is um, talk with some of the commissioners, the mayor, uh, city planners, whoever would be involved, and um, hopefully you can get them on your side because you're going to need them the whole process anyway. I love that advice. I think that's all very, very smart and very powerful. It's definitely some things I never even thought of, but yes, you have chamber of commerce events, you have charity organization events, you have, you know, those, those, um, you know, committee meetings and all of those things in your small towns and your larger towns. So take advantage of going to them. You might think, oh, that has nothing to do with me, but you never know in six to 12 months when you're ready to roll out or those letters are being mailed out, you'd be very glad you started to build some relationships um, you know, that, that could pay off in the end. So. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's all about people, you know, the laws are written as a guideline, but again, it's all about people and they can grant you, uh, things you may need. For example, in, in our venue, we are in the County. Uh, we are across the street from the city, but that property is not venue property. That's ours, but it's not part of the venue. And we talked about bringing in city water and city sewage, um, but that number was, that was bigger than putting in monstrous septic systems and all that. So from, from your, your zoning process, then after, and is it just one hearing? Is it multiple hearings? What was that like? You just have one and then they make a decision. Do you find out your decision there? Is it weeks later? What's that look like? So um, there, there are probably other versions of zoning, but most of the time, um, again, there's a board and there'll be usually an odd number, five or seven, and they'll vote. Now, it's, I've seen many times where they vote to postpone, and that's a result of several things, uh, not being prepared enough, uh, not being able to answer specific questions, and you may have more remonstrators against your proposal than they can handle. And um, another big one is they ask you to revise your proposal because they are not going to vote in favor of something. And they want you to come up with a drainage plan, let's say, or they, you know, in our case, we have 80 acres altogether. Um, yeah, narrow it down to what you're actually going to use. Well, we did that ahead of time, kind of because I've been there and got the prize for doing something stupid, but um, <laughs> m many things. Yeah, I've got many, many uh, red ribbons, you know, last place. Um, so um, it can be rendered later. The thing is that these hearings are generally once a month. So um, You'll, you have to turn in your documentation. Let's just say it's the first of the month. They want the documentation, all the paperwork by the 15th, because these people are basically required to go and look at your project, to drive out there, to look the property over, look over the paperwork prior to the meeting. Now, they don't all do that, but that's kind of the gist of it. So um, if you're postponed, it actually could be a couple of months. So, and, and it can drag on for a long time if you run into just opposition, you can't um, deal with. One of the, the fears is, and, and in Indiana, if you are turned down, you cannot reapply for one year. Oh, so wow. yeah, you would wanna be sure you get uh, postponed rather than denied. 
So it would actually be good news and a relief as opposed to just a flat out, nope, come back and see us in a year. Right. You, you, you know, whatever the problem is, you want a chance to work it out. Um, they will know. I mean, you'll know if generally if they're going to vote against it, you'll just run into all kinds of uh, negative things and, and so forth. And, and in that case, you really need to regroup and um, ask for postponement and we'll get you this extra information or we're going to rework that. Um, because if they vote and say, no, you're out for a year. Wow. So after your zoning process, and we all kind of figured out uh, in the story that it worked out for you, but did you, how many did you have? And, and then when were you finally approved? We had, we, we got it approved the first meeting. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, we were ready. I, yeah. So after you get approved, then what happens? So um, that is uh, like the first step. So then you have to have a site plan approval. And uh, site plans are very important because they talk about drainage, parking, um, uh, um, access for people in wheelchairs, uh, handicapped access, um, lighting, you know, night lighting. Um, there's a lot of things involved in the site plan. Uh, your buildings, um, in general, the, the local approval for building a new building is is not that big a deal because the state has to approve it. So if the state approves it, the local approval is generally uh, pretty simple. Uh, we were working on rehabbing uh, an old barn, two of them. Uh, as we gave up on one, the second one was a lot harder to give up, but uh, it ended up that to make it safe for, it was built as a horse barn, right? To make it safe to put 100 people in um, required things being built differently. It was the old, uh, what do they call it? They drill the holes and put the pegs in, um, mortise and tenon. And, you know, that's in today's world, that is not considered acceptable to put a bunch of people in. So it would have to have steel reinforcements. And uh, again, it was built as a horse barn, not as a wedding barn. So by the time you put a couple hundred thousand dollars in that, you still have an odd shaped building for a wedding venue. So um, we had to give up on that. It was not a historical building. It was just old. Yeah. So you went ahead and did a new build? We did. Yeah, we uh, ended up building two barns. Uh, if you go to our website, whiteoakfarmvenue.com, uh, you see pictures. The uh, larger barn we call the Cedar Barn. Uh, it's completely si sided with cedar on the outside. It is uh, actually a kit. Um, these outfits out of Oregon, and there's several of them, uh, make these uh, large timber barns, uh, big, solid beams. Uh, so that one, and then uh, we made, we built a smaller one. That one seats 300 for dinner. Our smaller, smaller one seats about 100. And it's kind of a typical uh, Indiana uh, mansard roof barn. I love that. That's crazy. That's like uh, the Ikea of a uh, wedding venue uh, production, sort of. I, uh, I have had the pleasure of touring a few barn or a few properties that actually had old Sears and Roebuck kits from like 1910 and yeah. 1918 that they built. And those things are, are still standing pretty solid and pretty well, but I can't imagine you didn't have internet to cheat and figure out what you did wrong and look up the instructions and have somebody do a video for you. So, so um, I can't imagine how challenging that would be even with a kit. I'm sure you had help and all the proper uh, suggested measures to put that up, but you know, going back to 1910, 1918 and uh, imagining what that looks like uh, is, is quite fun, but um, yeah. yeah. So then you, you uh, were able to move forward. You were able to proceed. When did you get approved for zoning? And then you had the next step of um, uh, your next steps that you had to do with um, your, your site plan. Do you have another so, hearing after that? Not really hearings, just approvals. approvals. And um, sometimes it was a twofold where you would need state approval and local. But again, uh, if the state, so we have, for example, fire protection, we have to have a fire well. Um, it's a 12 inch in diameter. Well, it goes down hundred and some feet. It'll pump enough water to, uh, you know, fill a yacht in about five minutes, but, um, 
those kinds of things, there are state requirements. And then um, the local approval is, is, is pretty foregone when you have the state. Um, there are, uh, again, you're dealing with people. So there are nuances. And, and, you know, if the building commissioner doesn't like you or, you know, has a bad day, that, that can be very difficult. And, and we dealt with some of that. We had an engineer that uh, was a former uh, city official and who I knew before, and he was difficult, and him and I came to odds uh, prior to his retirement, and then we hired him as an engineer to build our septic system, which uh, is incredibly complicated because of the state requirements, but uh, that helped a little bit because everybody knew who he was. Uh, he was still cranky, but getting <laughs> his plan approved was a little easier because it was him. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, I, I could, yeah, there's a lot, it, you know, building something new is very difficult. We had a general contractor. Um, I have a fair amount of experience in rehabbing, but I had never built anything from scratch. So, uh, we hired a, and, and that's another, um, important point that I've, I've ran into, uh, prior on other real estate deals is your general contractor, you really need to vet them out. Um, we talked to several and you're at risk with your general contractor. If uh, anything goes wrong, you're the one signed on the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, <laughs> we had some scary times, but we had an excellent contractor. So uh, if we had one of the not fly by night necessarily, but uh, people who had not handled a project like ours. So for example, the, the barn that was a kit, uh, who knows how to build a kit barn? We're talking about timbers that are 10 inches square and 30 feet long. Uh, they already have the holes drilled. So if you don't put it together correctly, uh, it's a big problem. And um, they ended up hiring an Amish crew and we have a lot of Amish in eastern, northeastern Indiana. And uh, in talking to them, um, they um, uh, built the uh, Noah's Ark somewhere in Kentucky. So we thought, yeah, if you can build Noah's Ark, you That's can build this. That's the reference we were looking for right there. We're good to yeah. go. That's a sign. That's a sign that we're on to smooth sailing. So yeah. from the time you went through these processes and then you were building, when did you decide that you would be willing to go ahead and have couples tour your property? Um, I know we're talking about zoning, so that's kind of much before tours start to come in and we skipped over a big bunch, but I know that um, we're going to run out of time. So I wanted to just uh, you know, answer another question that comes up a lot with the new venue owners and people starting a venue. And that is we're under construction or we're starting construction. When did you start to have wedding venue tours? And when did you start to book people? Do you wait until immediately, you're, immediately right, right. And do you also start your, your website and your social media at the same time? Like you go ahead and start those things earlier. We did, we did. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I mean, the bottom line is, uh, you know, weddings are planned far in advance, at least six months, mo some two years. So if you wait until you're completed, you're not going to have any weddings for six months. No, you got to, uh, and people, it's weird. People like walking around in the, in the dirt and seeing the construction equipment and you tell them your dream. You have to have pictures, renderings and that yeah. sort of thing. And we, uh, the company that uh, we bought the kit from uh, had a uh, interactive, um, what do you call it, uh, rendering. So with a computer, you could actually walk into the barn, walk through the doors, look up and see the ceiling and oh, all yeah, that. Those are cool. I love that. Yeah, they um, uh, and they did that. And, and uh, I suspect a lot of contractors can. But we sold... Um, uh, my wife actually is the one who who does all that. I'm taking credit for a lot of her stuff, of course. But uh, we had a hundred weddings booked before our first wedding, May first this year. Oh my gosh, that's crazy! That's so exciting. Yeah. You guys are amazing that you did that. That is awesome. A lot of people can't 
get that process going for a long time. So for, I man, I sometimes I just wish I had a virtual award to just stick right through there and put on your desk because that is worthy of some serious wedding industry praise to get that accomplished. You know, was there um was there a process of advertising that did you research that? Did you do a lot of grassroots? Was it your social media? What was successful for you? Facebook. Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. One of the things we did is we posted a lot of photos of the construction and, you know, guys out there working and so forth. The Amish, that was kind of funny because, uh, you know, they don't believe in graven images. So I asked their permission to take photos and they said, just, uh, you know, don't show pictures of our faces. So, um, you know, we respected that. So what we ended up doing is really not taking any photos of the workers, but taking photos at the end of the day. And we were very lucky. Um, I can't, you know, I, I know we'd like to pin a medal, but it really wasn't our genius. It was the timing of COVID. Uh, we started construction in November 19. And, you know, by February, COVID had hit and uh, it was a big problem. And, you know, an outdoor venue, well, we're not, we do have outdoor space, but the construction guys working outdoors, they had no problem. They never quit. They never, you know, so they worked all the way through. And our luck is that, uh, and we're fortunate, we're, we're very blessed in, in the sense that we weren't ready to have weddings when we couldn't. If we had finished a year earlier, it would have been a disaster. But we were lucky because, okay, you can come and look and you can book, but we're booking 20 of 20, 2021. Because we, you know, construction's not going to be complete. And so uh, a lot of couples, and you guys pretty well know this, a lot of couples just moved their weddings from 2020 to 2021. And then the newly engaged found everybody's book is full. So we were, you know, we were a blank slate. So uh, we filled up pretty nicely. And, and you know, we're, we're pretty blessed in that. It, it really wasn't sheer genius. It was sheer luck. What made you decide to focus on your um, social media instead of spending a lot of money on the big web wedding websites? Oh, we did that. Oh, oh you did. You did try it. Yeah. We did a one-year contract. What? I can't say anything good. Okay. Well, I, I think we all can read the thought bubbles over my head and your head. People know how I feel. That's no secret. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, my yeah. opinion is just one person. It's nice to get advice and information. And just to remind people, you own your website, you harness so much power in that you harness so much power in your own social media and your own efforts and those things combining together to make a powerful wedding uh, marketing campaign for you that leads back to you. It doesn't go to someone else to get filtered and then come back around to you after it's been blasted out to all your competitors. <laughs> so you know, it's a great that you are proof that if you do it yourself and you master that yourself, it's going to provide a better return and better conversion rates than, you know, investing that money somewhere else in someone else's best SEO. Yeah. I, and, I, and I have to tell you, the other thing that we found is that uh, brides uh, would start tagging the, and they do, they tag themselves and uh, they'll tag White Oak Farm Venue in some of their posts. Hey, we're having our wedding in six weeks at White Oak. And then uh, the real beauty of it is now that we're having a lot of weddings is we're getting tagged all over the place. The, the photographer is tagging us, the caterer is tagging us, the, you know, flower girls and, and all the people that attended. And so it's, it's really snowballed. Um, and um, I'm not positive of this, but I believe right now we are spending zero on paid anything. That is outstanding. Well, one wedding can morph into three weddings. You know, somebody's cousins, somebody's friends, yeah. their, their, their grouping is in that age range where they're thinking about getting married, you know, their peer group, um, sisters, family, all that kind of thing. So when you have one wedding, you could potentially have three more weddings if you do it well and you have that social media presence and you use that well. If you have a hundred weddings, 
<laughs> Obviously, we hope that that morphs into so many more weddings beautifully as well with the word of mouth, which obviously is very powerful. And thank you, social media, that blasts our word of mouth out even better. Um, so I love to hear that because I, um, I think that uh, when you have control over your own advertising and marketing, uh, there's just so many more benefits for it. I think it also benefits the local wedding industry a lot better as well. Um, because it's not perpetuating that myth that you have to spend a fortune on those websites. You can spend your money locally or your time, energy, and effort locally and have that pay off for you. Somebody else doesn't have to come in and, and um, stick their nose in that, so to speak. So Yeah, and, and I'll say one other thing, too, is that when we were doing our research, as everybody does, on uh, what you want to do is... Um, we looked at all the venues within driving distance of us and trying to compare um, amenities is very difficult. Trying to compare, uh, you know, one has got, you know, a smaller par uh, parcel of land, one has got a waterfall, all these things are very difficult. What we did is we boiled it down to price per person. So we took uh, all the venues that we could price the venue with out food and alcohol because some of them were an all-in you have to buy the food and alcohol and you get the venue free or whatever um so we couldn't compare those but the way we do it is we rent a venue and then they pay for their food and all that other stuff on their own so um we took the venue so let's say it's a hundred person venue they charge five thousand dollars it's fifty dollars a person so we took all those and put them on a flow chart and then we gave them a little bit of weight if they were a cool place or if they were kind of crummy. And then we took uh, an average and we took the mean and we went a little under that. So then we took that number and multiplied it into our project to make sure we could afford to do this. And um, so we priced ourselves under our competitors uh, to start with. And the whole reason behind that is if I'm charging $50 or $60 per person, I know how much I'm making if it's not rented, right? So if it's rented, I'm making something. You just got to be sure it's above your costs. And so now we have a, a pretty full calendar and we are booking 2023. Um, so we're able to bring our prices up and a little bit more uh, of the norm rather than, than uh, under the normal. So um, for pricing, did you, have a, did you have an enticing deposit structure? Well, I don't know anything other than what we, we do, and that is 50% uh, when you book. I don't know about the others. 100% when you book, that'd be kind of cool. Uh, $500 to me would be a little bit scary. But I have to tell you that uh, part of our internal thought process is we want the perfect couple. So uh, we're a brand new venue. So we are more expensive than the basement of the church or the VFW or, you know, uh, the fairgrounds, whatever. So we don't want people that can't afford us because that's bad for everybody. And um, we, we've kind of set things up in such a way that um, we have had a few people that can't afford us. They just wanted it because the place is cool. Yeah. Um, but, they just you know, it'll gonna, work itself out in the end. We're, we're going to do this. Yeah. And then, you know, they're not doing alcohol, which uh, causes uh, issues because people have trunks full of alcohol out in the parking lot. Um, and uh, the other thing is that sadly, those weddings end very early. Uh, the party's over by 10 o'clock where those that uh, have alcohol seem to have a better uh, outcome. But it's okay if they're a non-alcoholic group. We had one of those uh, Sunday and they just, you know, they, they didn't believe in it or didn't drink and that, and they had a good time. Uh, but them not being able to afford it and, and cutting corners elsewhere, I think that puts a little black eye on us as well. Um, and so we try to avoid that. Um, we try to avoid, we had somebody actually ask my wife, uh, the, uh, the groom says, uh, do you mind if my buddies carry? And she's like, well, you can carry whatever you want. You know, we have some carts if you need it. 
He says, no, 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 no. They, they carry. It's like she had no idea what he was talking about. He had to tell her they carry guns. And she's like, oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we don't mix that. No. So, uh, you know, yeah, that that was just a train wreck looking for a place to happen. I mean, yeah. nobody needs to carry a gun at a wedding. We do have, and, and that's another note, uh, we, we have uh, policemen, security at every wedding. Oh my gosh, I'm hearing this more and more and I just cannot say how much I love this. Um, I have a lot of venue owners, you know, I've met hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of venue owners. There's no right way and there's no wrong way. There is the way that works best for that particular venue owner. And that's what's beautiful about this business is that, um, you know, what you feel comfortable with, what is your personality conveys into your wedding venue and your policies and also into the clientele that will fit really well there. Um, so having that communication and really having a good understanding of what you, uh, what is appropriate for you and what your boundaries are and who can fit within those boundaries and work well together is a beautiful thing. When you don't have uh, a reading for that, that it's a recipe for a problem because you're not going to weed people out that are potentially going to really just not work well with your venue. You're taking everybody, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, the the security for me, I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, we, we've had horror stories. We've seen them in the uh, wedding venue owners and managers community on Facebook. Um, you know, there, there was a, um, a, a death at a um, Fairfax County wedding uh, years ago that was really devastating and sad. Um, there's just been, you know, issue that, you know, there's been reports of venue owners. I've seen footage of one getting hit over the head with a, um, a beer bottle. And that was an incredibly affluent wedding. People just didn't want to leave. You know, sometimes when you shut those bars down, people get mad. They're not done oh, drinking yeah. and they've already been drinking. So they're not the best communicators at that point. And uh, we just had a venue owner posting um, a week or two ago that he was just getting annihilated with bad online reviews because they attempted to shut the, the bar down at the contracted time. And the clients argued they had nine more minutes or 11 more minutes or something like that. So a huge brawl and all of this, uh, you know, online, um, you know, animosity and bad reviews and attacking this business for 11 minutes because they wanted to drink. And then it came out in their statements that they were posting online, trying to justify, you know, their behavior that they really wanted another hour. So it wasn't really about the 11 minutes. They wanted they just wanted to stay and continue drinking. Um, and our venue owners put themselves at a lot of risk. Um, sometimes their guests do. So having safe places with very well organized plans for policies and structure and security, I love that very much. I mean, I, I'm, I'm here for that all day. The other thing, uh, since we hold the liquor license, uh, we decided in the very beginning is we don't do anything that resembles a shot. So, um, you know, I get it. There's guys my age and older that like to just have a, a whiskey, you know, neat. And uh, that's okay. You know, they could probably hold it. They know how much they can handle, but you, you can't do it with the young kids because, well, you've seen it, you know, the videos. Um, so we don't allow anything. It's a shot. Um, they want an ounce of whiskey. What do you want it mixed with? It's going to have ice and it's going to have a mixer, even if it's uh, just soda water. Um, but we do not serve any raw alcohol. We just don't do it. And I had, uh, I had an older guy or not older, but mature gentleman, uh, kind of challenged me on it. And I said, you know, we're here to have a good time. If you want to get drunk somewhere, this is not the place. I, um, uh, you know, a lot of people struggle with the parking lot and the, um, alcohol being brought in. I actually was at a wedding, uh, at the end of 2019 and uh, someone that I used to work with showed up there. So I was working the wedding as the catering director and somebody came with a, with bottles in their purse clanking around and they were so inebriated before the reception even started. So uh, any couples or anybody out there planning wed wedding that happens to watch this, you know, typically the people that watch these videos are wedding venue owners, but anyone else that's watching this just realize that alcohol, it just causes so many problems. It has to be well-structured. It has to be well-managed. There are rules for a reason. They're for safety. They're for everyone to have a great time and therefore everyone to be able to, you know, enjoy themselves 
and have fun without somebody getting too out of hand, without people throwing up everywhere or going out. There's a lot of people that for whatever reason love to go outside and pee in the bushes. Um, you, d- you know, there's bathrooms everywhere, but we got to go outside. And, you know, the thing, the moment those things start to happen, it's an issue. Also the, the bars and the trunk of the car. Um, I've seen that happen a lot. I, I came up to do a, um, a you know, little wedding uh, research at a wedding venue owner, a uh, wedding venue. And um, the bridesmaids were in the parking lot with coolers, pulling the coolers of alcohol out and having it right there. And this was in a downtown area. And any cop that goes by, any police that go by, anyone that goes by and sees this, that can be fines for the venue. That can be the venue getting shut down or having you know yeah. issues with the venue. And this is why um, our venue owners struggle a lot when they're trying to get started is that whole set, set um, uh, the whole issue of safety coming up because of alcohol. So when people are irresponsible and are bringing it in those ways, and then when the venue owner tries to regulate that or um, use their contract or remind people of their policies and contract, a lot of times that's when our venue owners get backlash, get the bad reviews, get attacked online. And, you know, um, so that's a really tricky situation. So does your security, do you feel like help alleviate a lot of those issues for you? I have them walk the parking lot for sure. Um, the other thing that we uh, started doing that uh, seems really well received, and we don't charge for it, we just throw it in, is uh, we'll give the grooms essentially a beer apiece, you know, half, uh, half a 12 pack or whatever. And then we make mimosas for the women uh, as they're getting ready. It just kind of takes the edge off uh, of them wanting to bring something in because they're not going to get alcohol until after the uh, ceremony, which might be five o'clock. So we just started giving them uh, a little bit, you know, about a beer a piece and a mimosa a piece. And um, again, uh, we have the security and we have in their contract, as I'm sure about everybody does, if they're found to have uh, alcohol, it'll be confiscated and thrown away. We haven't had to do that yet. Well, I love that. I am so excited that we got a chance to chat today because this is information we've never had the chance to share. Um, I have talked to so many venue owner or hopeful venue owners that got their dreams dashed at the zoning process that that never right. got where, where you got. And you mentioned five years. There's some venue owners um, that I have, you know, met and talked to that, you know, the process took them six years and there's counties that set up specific laws to keep wedding venues from coming in. You know, some of those counties out there will do uh, mandatory, uh, paved parking lot. People are not going to do that on their beautiful, pristine farmland. Um, or you have to widen your beautiful historic road with the winding trees that goes up to your property. You got to widen that, which means cutting down all your historic trees and just little things like that to keep venues from opening, um, I think that communication is the biggest issue and fear, and that is that our our neighbors, our communities, don't understand what a wedding and what the wedding industry is. It's not just you know somebody's aunt throwing illegal parties in the backyard, and uh, you know all, you know people drunk leaving in chaos. These are really well thought out, really incredible businesses that are doing amazing things locally and bringing so much value locally. Billion dollar industry that provides so much support to other industries, creates jobs, creates value in our communities. I think our communities just don't understand what we do. And so, you know, you being here with me today, Greg, and sharing your story is so important and so amazing. And I'm so thankful to have had you and to take your time like this, which is so valuable. I appreciate you so much. What you shared today is absolutely gonna help another venue owner as they prepare for, you know, to live their dream. This is really a dream uh, for a lot of people as they are starting their families and starting their, you know, uh, investing portfolio in their, you know, their life career as an adult, instead of going into business for someone else, they're going into business for themselves. And this is someone's dream as they're going out of business, working for someone else and going into their own business and and having that their retirement plan. So um, this means so much to a lot of people. This is This is their life. This is what their life plan is, not just a fun thing we thought would be great to do. It's it's really, um, you know, just so important to share this information. And I'm just so thankful for you. Yeah, thank you. And you're right in a a sense that um, you have to treat it as a business, uh, not as a hobby. 
We'll talk about that some other time, but um, I would just say when you are looking for a wedding venue, really look for a venue that on their website or their social media, you can see that they have a passion for weddings, that they understand weddings, that they have great wedding policies, that they require contracts and insurance. You want all those things as a couple and you want all those things as your business neighbors are coming in. So um, all of those things protect our community and make weddings a lot more fun and um, polished and professional. And then all of those gorgeous images get out and then our local communities become well known and people want to come and have a wedding there. And that's that's beautiful. That's the dream. Not just great local weddings, but destination weddings. People coming from New York to come to your venue or finding, you know, dreaming about it from California. You know, people starting to talk about your community and your, your, your state and, um, you know, really getting excited because those weddings have done so well to go viral and create, you know, a romance for your wedding community. So all of the work that you do is so important, not only for your business, but for all of our businesses and for all the wedding industry professionals that want to work with you and want to have a lot of weddings. And then also our, of course, our couples who want to have great weddings and their guests. It's just so many people connected that all of your hard work supports and, you know, works for. I'm going to put um, Greg's information in the um, at the end of the video. We'll put the website, uh, all of your, you know, to come and look at your social media and stuff. So we'll put all those links in there. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for do a great job. Time. Thank you. Thank you for Have a what good day. you do. Uh -huh. Bye. Uh -huh.